last time we looked at part one of the life of King Saul. I mean, he was had a wonderful life. He was following God, and he was enjoying a mountaintop experience of life, of being king, right? So what would mess that up? What would be that change in him? Well, the change that would make him, that would bring him from a man of God to a serial killer was not just overnight. It was a slow process, a very slow change. And it would all involve how he would mishandle his curveball of life. You know, those unexpected events, those traumatic events in our life that just happened for a split second and they change the trajectory of our lives? Well, the curveballs of life can come from three different sources. We can create our own curveballs of life, or our curveballs of life can come from others, or our curveballs of life can come from an accident, like a natural disaster, whether it be a fire or flood an earthquake. And we're going to see in today's devotional that King Saul had brought on his own curveball of life. What would he do? Well, you have to remember that he was in a very powerful position. His decisions were affecting thousands and thousands of people, their protection. And when a person is placed in a very powerful position, they have to make sure that their relationship with their Heavenly Father is grounded, is unshakable, is not flowing to and from. Because when a person is in leadership, leading thousands and thousands of people, people want that leader to be steady. They want that leader to be steadfast. And the only way a person can do that is by making sure that their relationship with their Heavenly Father is supreme. It trumps anything else in their life. Even their own reputation. Even their own empire that they have built. Do they prize what their Heavenly Father thinks of them more than how other people perceive them? That is a very tough situation for a leader to be in, right? You're constantly having to keep yourself grounded in God. And we can see that King Saul, this slips, he starts to forget about his God. He starts to let his relationship slip. He starts to see how others perceive him as more important than how his Heavenly Father perceives him. The first time that we see a slip, a sign of this, is in 1 Samuel chapters 13, 1 through 4. 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 13, 1 through 4. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Michmash in the hill country of Bethel. The other 1,000 went with Saul's son Jonathan to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated 
the garrison of the Philistines at Geba. The news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear this, rise up in revolt. All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba, and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So you can see in the, these passages that Saul is married. He has a son, Jonathan, and Jonathan is actually fighting with him in this battle. And we can see that Jonathan goes in and defeats this garrison, this Philistine garrison. And guess what? Saul is proclaim, pro proclaiming this in front of the Israelites as he was the one that did this, not his son, Jonathan. He's taking the credit, and he's not allowing his son to get the credit for this. So you may be wondering, well, Jennifer, I thought you said your relationship with God, you know, if it slips. Well, our relationship with our, with our Heavenly Father, you know, we look at it as like two people in a relationship, right? It's us and our Heavenly Father. But it really starts in the home. How are we treating our own family members? How are we treating the people that we live with? This incident, when Saul is in battle with his son Jonathan, and he does not allow his son to take credit for what is due him, he steals that credit because he wants to look better in front of the people than his own son. You can see that his relationship with his Heavenly Father has already slipped. How do you think this, how do you think Jonathan thought about this when he heard about this? My own dad doing this to me? We see a slip in Saul, it continues, okay? It continues. And I'm going to read in uh, the same chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel didn't, still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash, ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has also appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So you can see that this is... Um, that Saul's progressing even more. This disobedience is being played out in um, his spiritual walk. 
the burnt offerings. He was offering these burnt offerings, these peace offerings, and he had no business doing this. This was the responsibility of the priest. This was the responsibility of Samuel, not Saul's. Saul was king. He was supposed to be doing his job in battle. And in this particular battle, he's retreating. Where He's not fearless. He's, he, and it's all because he's, 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 he's letting his relationship slip with his Heavenly Father. And this is being displayed in his lack of obedience and where it needs to be. So with the first instance, we can see that Saul takes the credit for his son's um, huge battle, battle achievement. And then we can see that Saul disobeys God with uh, doing the offerings. And then we see another time in which Saul is disobeying. So it's a process that keeps, it's a slow process, and we still see that he keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And this actually is disobedience um, out on the battlefield again. Um, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 through 24. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, Yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. So Saul is on the battlefield and he is battling the Amalekites. And the specific orders that God had given him were he was to destroy everything. He was to destroy all of the people. He was to destroy all of the animals. There wasn't supposed to be one thing left. And what he chooses to do is he obeys a little bit. He doesn't do 100% obedience. He actually leaves the king of the Amalekites alive. And he actually keeps the best of their animals. And so he's telling... Saul, uh, he's telling Samuel here in these verses that, you know, he's offering these animals as the, the offerings. And, um, and Samuel is telling him, no, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I love the last verse, 24, when it says, um, this is uh, Saul talking he was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. So that's what I'm talking about. He got to the point where he was allowing how others, what he thought, how others viewed him instead of how God views him. What others want compared to what God wants. And he was taking others that had already been an idol that he was choosing in his life time and time again. There's another incident that happens after this, and this is the famous scene of David and Goliath. And what we really need to think about on this special day is that King Saul was there. King Saul had been there every single day when Goliath was out there flaunting his big physical characteristics and intimidating all of the Israelites. King Saul was the tallest man in the Israelite in the Israelites, much taller than David. And I have done a devotional on David and how he exercised his fearless muscle. 
And if you're interested in that devotional, I'm going to leave it at the end of this devotional. But I talk about in there how we all have a fearless muscle. Um, if we are believers in Christ, you know, God has put his spirit within us. And that is a fearless muscle. And it only gets bigger um, the more times we use it. And, you know, David had this history of exercising his fearless muscle. That's what actually changed his mindset that day. And you know what? We're given Saul's history of exercising his fearless muscle time and time again. And he didn't draw on that that day. We're talking about the same Saul who had this amazing victory with uh, rescuing the people of Jabesh Gilead, recruiting 330,000 soldiers, and defeated the Jabesh Gilead's enemies. Saul had exercised his fearless muscle time and time again by cleaving to his Heavenly Father. And he wasn't able to do that that day because his relationship had been slipping and had slipped a very long time at this point. And it's so sad. Another instance we're going to pull up, and I'm going to pull these two scriptures up, and it's going to really show the stark contrast between um, the old Saul and the new Saul, okay? Okay. Uh, the old Saul back in the Jabesh Gilead days and then the new Saul that we're seeing now. And this incident actually happened um, right after this David and Goliath um, scene. So 1 Samuel chapter 18. Verses 6 through 9. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has had David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this? He said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And then I'm going to put the, um, I want you to see this. This so this scene actually happens right after um, David gets back from um, defeating the Philistines and this chant that the women are singing to him is really getting under his skin, okay? Um, because they're comparing David's victories with Saul's and the numbers um, are looking more favorable for David than Saul. And so... Uh, his response is, he's jealous of David. This is getting to be really under his skin. And so I'm going to put a verse up here. We're going to go back to the one um, where it was the old Saul. And the same exact thing was happening. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. When Saul returned to his home at Gibeah, a group of men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But there were some scoundrels who complained, How can this man save us? And they scorned him and refused to bring him gifts. But Saul ignored them. And then, and then I'm going to read chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. So remember, this is right after Samuel makes it public that Saul's going to be king. Remember this? I had talked about this in the last devotional, and he has the critics who are, you know, making fun of him, like, who is he to be king? Um, and then 
he just ignores them, okay? So very different, you know, very different than what he's doing now, right? He's not ignoring, he's letting it fester. And, um, and then he has this amazing victory when he's king. And then this is, this is what happens after that amazing victory. This is when he first becomes king, right? This is the old Saul. This is the good Saul. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. Then the people exclaimed to Samuel, Now where are those men who said, Why should Saul rule over us? Bring them here, and we will kill them. But Saul replied, No one will be executed today, for today the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us all go to Gilgal to renew the kingdom. So they all went to Gilgal, and in a solemn ceremony before the Lord, they made Saul king. Then they offered peace offerings to the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites were filled with joy. So after that first defeat, after King Saul had won that for the Jabesh Gilead, you know, the people were like, where were those men that... You know we're so critical and you know don't they that you don't need to be king let's kill them let's have them killed and saul is not take he's not saul is not being easily swayed by men's opinions right he's not being swayed by men's opinions he is putting god before them he's like no we're not going to do this we are not going to do this so the old saul he ignores the critics. He ignores, he preserves life. And this, this new Saul that's emerging, that's changing before our very eyes, he doesn't ignore them. He, he's forgotten all about his Heavenly Father, and it's been going on for a long time. He's let his relationship slip. And this chant festers in his mind. And this is what he grabs a hold of, latches onto. And David becomes his number one target. This is when he starts trying to take out a life, an innocent man. At this point, you know, Saul has already been fired as king, right? Samuel has already told him that, okay? Samuel already told him that, that you're fired. And he was supposed to let go of that leadership and to give it to David. And David would actually become his son-in-law. And Saul never does do that. That's why he's trying to kill David to prevent this firing of his position. So how does he become, how does this one person that he's trying to kill turn into a serial killer? Well, the thing is, he's trying to take out one person and he tries multiple times many different methods, and it doesn't work. People are helping David stay alive all along the way. And those helpers are, he either tries to murder them or he murders them. When David marries into the family, you know, this sin rips families apart. Sin tears relationships up and we see this in this family this father-in-law who's trying to kill his own family member a son-in-law a guy who's married into his family and it creates division you've got his wife uh saul's daughter michael who protects david um she's a survivor you have Jonathan, Saul's son, 
who protects David in staying alive. His dad actually tries to murder him, and he stays alive. There are priests that live in the land of Nob. There's one priest there that actually helps David in staying alive. Because David is, he's hiding, he's running, he's, you know, he's trying to stay alive. And so there's a priest in the land of Nob that actually uh, rescues him and helps him. And word gets back to King Saul about this. And so King Saul is furious. Um, he kills this priest he actually kills all of the priests in the land of Nob. He actually ends up not not only killing all of the, the priests, the preachers there, uh, he's killing everybody. He killed everybody in the land of Nob and all of their animals and everything. He doesn't leave one single survivor. And it's interesting because, you know, back in the day when he was supposed to be in battle and God would ask him, this is, you know, you're supposed to kill everybody in this battle with the um, Amalekites, and he disobeyed God. And then here's, here he's on this serial killing spree, and uh, he's murdering everybody in sight. He's not leaving one single survivor. Um, so that is how he becomes a serial killer, and it is so sad. He does not handle his curveball of life in the right way. He is the source of a lot of other people, a lot of other people's curveballs of life. You think about the friends of all of those people who died in the land of Nob. Um, there's not an exact number, but it says there's 85 priests. And so, I mean, well over a hundred people that he had killed. Um, and he actually has Doeg, um, he orders Doeg to do this, 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 this mass insurrection of people. He actually ends up murdering himself, Saul does. He is in battle, and Jonathan's in battle with the Philistines. And Saul is actually injured by an arrow. And an archer, the arrow from the archer of Philistine actually um, lands on Saul. And so he asks for his armor bearer to actually kill him, to finish him off because he's injured, because he's afraid of what the Philistines are going to do to him with his body, um, torture him. And his armor bearer says, no, I'm not going to kill you. And so Saul ends up murdering himself. After he does that, then he's actually responsible for his armor bearer because his armor bearer murders himself. He commits suicide. And so all of this turmoil that Saul causes with all of this innocent blood that is on his hands. All of this turmoil that he causes with his own family. He just, he was a nightmare. He calls nightmares for other people. And it's all because he did not handle his curveball of life. He did not cleave to his Heavenly Father. You know, this reason of why this man of God turned into a serial killer, you know, it's very shocking, right? It's very surprising. Handling our curveballs of life are so important. 
cleaving to our Heavenly Father is so vital. There is not one person in this world who is exempt from the enemy. The enemy is out to destroy anybody and everybody that he can. And the number one way he does that is with the curveballs of life. If you think, well, Jennifer, you know, you just don't know me. My curveball, it's pretty horrific. Well, I've got good news for you. The Bible is full of horrific stories. And our Heavenly Father, you know, He gives us people that we can identify with. And this brings us comfort and hope. And I'm actually going to be sharing with you um, my testimony in the next part three of this series. And, um, you know, how my curveball of life really changed the trajectory of my life. And how I, I look at this story, I can really resonate with parts of this story on a very real level now that I could have never had done before my curveball of life happened. So you're not going to, you are not going to want to miss part three. That is my spiritual food for you to munch on the rest of the week. I can't wait to see you next time.